Good morning, Thomas Road. Are you glad to be in the room? We're glad to see you. Come on, everybody. Let's stand together. We haven't done this in a while. Sing it with me. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. That's right. We are here.
How great you are, Lord. How great.
pray together. God, today, together, we declare that you are an awesome God. How majestic is your name in all of the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. As we gaze into the night sky, we see the, the moon and the stars. Who are we? Just mere humans that you are mindful of us. Yet you are God and you care for us. That's why we can come boldly to your throne with our petitions and our prayers. So today, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for these in our midst that are sick, for Charles Carey and A.C. Cooper, Lord, for May Harlow and Lori Mays and Janet Powell and Lana Rice, Susan Roberts, for Tom Robinson and Edgar Wingfield. And the list goes on, Lord, for Mike Adams and Jerry Brooks and Ivan Buck and Michelle Bucklew. Jennifer Kesey and Edward McCoy, Mike Middleton, our dear friends and fellow servants over there in Russia, Jerry and Marla Schroeder, Lord, we lift them up to you today and Eleanor Washburn. And for the families who are grieving the loss of a loved one, Lord, today we cling to the promise and the hope of eternity with you in a place called heaven and to be absent from the body is to be present in the Lord. So in the midst of our grief and our sorrow today, Lord, we find comfort and hope. But Lord, will you just wrap your arms around the families of Mur Murphy Marsh and Doug Zipperer today. Lord, bring to them a peace that, that surpasses all of our understanding, a peace, Lord, that we just can't wrap our mind around. Thank you, God, that you are here in our midst today. We've already experienced your presence here in this room this morning. We welcome you here with the praise from our lips. So, Lord, continue to meet with us in a moment as Pastor Jonathan comes. Open up our hearts and our minds to the truth that you have for us today. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, you can be seated. So glad you're here to worship with us today. If this happens to be your first time, find one of those QR codes on a seat back in front of you. You can take out your phone and turn your camera on, aim it right there. It'll take you to a page where you can uh, register your visit today. We'd love for you to do that. Then go out in the main lobby after the service. Our team out at the Connect Center has something for you, but we're glad that you are here with us. We're continuing our worship now as we give up our tithes and our offerings. Uh, so the ushers are passing the plates throughout the sanctuary. Thank you so much for being such uh, faithful givers. Several ways you can give in the plates today as you leave the boxes. Uh, many places online where, where you, can, you can give through our app and various other places, or you can just mail your offering in. But uh, it's because of your faithful giving that we're able to carry out the ministry of our church. And can I tell you that ministry is happening all over Thomas Road. I, I don't know when during my time of serving here, I've seen the Lord blessing and using the various ministries of our church. And uh, we often get, get asked, like, what's going on in the week? Well, let me tell you, not only are we having times of worship like this, there's teaching that's happening all throughout the week. So our team has done a pretty amazing job at putting together a teaching map. And you can, uh, the information is there on the screen. Uh, you can see what's being taught throughout the various ministries. And we're so grateful for the faithful teachers of God's word. And uh, we encourage you to um, find your place in that as whether it's a small group or whatever it may be. But thanks to our team for putting together uh, this, this incredible tool uh, right here. This coming Thursday night, seven o'clock right here in the room, uh, we're gonna have a fantastic movie premiere. Throughout the history of, of the church, there has have been movements of the Lord. Uh, there have been revivals that have been just extraordinary. And one such revival took place out in California back in the 70s. And that's what this movie is all about, the Jesus Revolution. Uh, we're only one of 10 churches who's going to be participating in this. And um, so we invite you to come out. Pastor Jonathan is going to tell you a little bit more about that later on. In fact, at the end of the service, uh, we have have a two-minute trailer. We want to give you a little sneak preview of that movie. So we ask you not to leave and just stick around for that, um, that trailer. But this Thursday night, we're expecting the place to be filled. Doors open at six o'clock. So we invite you to come out uh, and be a part of that. 
One thing that I'd like for you to put on your calendar, we mentioned this several months ago, but we really wanted to get it on everybody's radar. In fact, if you're watching us from home or wherever you may be, uh, and you're looking for a time to come out and maybe worship with us on Sunday evening, March the 5th, right here at six o'clock, our worship ministry has put together with, with the, the help of some of the best arrangers and orchest orchestrators in all of the world. We're gonna have a, a concert that celebrates the legacy of the hymns of the church. And the stage is going to be filled with uh, an orchestra. We'll have the choir spilling out of the loft. I have no idea where I'm going to put them. Uh, but it's going to be a wonderful evening. Put that on your calendar, Sunday evening, March the 5th, and we would love for you to be with us. Speaking of wonderful musicians and a great choir, aren't you glad to have this Thomas Road Choir back in here today and this orchestra? Along with LU Praise, it's always a joy to have LU Praise. And so uh, sit back and enjoy the ministry of the Thomas Road Choir and LU Praise.
Thank you, Annalise. What a great song. What a great reminder. And once in a while, a song will come out that just speaks to my soul personally. I don't know if you know this one or not. But if you do, I'd love to hear you just sing it with me. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name
today we recognize that your name is power and your name is healing, your name is life. And I think that for every single one of us gathered in this room, God, we need that today. God, we need power. Lord, we need to know that we stand up in a world today that is running so far from you and putting so, so much pressure on those of us who follow you. God, we need your power. We need your strength. God, there are people in this room who are sick, who are hurting. Doctors have said there's just not a lot of hope. There's a lot of heartache and a lot of heartbreak as a result of what we hear. God, we need healing. God, we live in a time where life can be so discouraging, where hearts can be so broken, where tears are shed so much. God, we need life. Together, we come together and we recognize today that God, that life and that healing and that power doesn't come from anything that we can do. It doesn't come from anything that we can create. It doesn't come from any book that we can read. It doesn't come from any conference that we can attend. It doesn't come from any class that we can be a part of. God, we know that it only comes from Jesus. And so today, God, we celebrate the name of Jesus. It is power and it is healing and it is life. And now as we open your word and we hear the words of Jesus, as we study what Jesus taught us so many years ago, God, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our ears to what you have to say. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive what today I know so many in this room and so many watching, so many listen, listening desperately need. God, that they need wisdom and they need direction and they need light and they need correction, God, where they've messed up. And God, we know that you're not a God who condemns, but you're a God who came to save. And so God, if there's someone watching, someone listening, or someone seated here that today needs to declare in their hearts, to declare with their lips, that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died and that he rose again, and he's the only one that can save. Father, I pray that today that is the declaration that would be made, and that is the decision that would be made, and that, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And God, we thank you in advance of the work you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Powerful worship this morning, don't you think? You know, back here playing this piano is a guy named Patrick Colby Shorts. And uh, come on out here real quick, man. This guy is, is an awesome young man. He's not young anymore, actually. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, wanted, I wanted you to know, I mean, you've seen him around here a long time. He's been a part of our team for many, many years. But just this past week, mm -hmm. uh, we actually launched a brand new thing out of Liberty University called Seven Hills Worship. And it is going to be, I firmly believe, with the talent and with the God-given gifts that uh, have been given to so many of our students and so many of our faculty, which he is one of, that the, the creation of and the writing of and the production of the worship that is coming out of, of these young hearts that are so passionate, like LU Praise and like so many others, uh, it is something I, I think that can change and transform the church. And so this last week, we launched Seven Hills Worship and... For the very first time, this past Wednesday, we released the very first song that I believe will go out in churches all over the world. He actually is the, the guy who is leading that, worship, that song in worship that just came out this week. And so I want to put up on the screen, just, I'm going to leave that there just for a second. And I encourage you to go and you can take your phone and you can use that QR code there, which will take you to either Spotify or Apple Music or whatever it is that you want to do. You can stream that song. You need to hear that song. And it just simply says, Christ in me, our hope for glory. And that is in a powerful song. And thank you for bringing it to us. Thank you for sharing it with the world. Thank you for all that God is doing in and through you. And so I want you to go and stream that song. Uh, because we really want that song and the songs that will be coming every four to five weeks out of the incredibly talented individuals that are part of it. It's going to, I believe, change the church. And so thank you for all that you do. Appreciate you, buddy. Hey, I want you to uh, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in this passage today as we continue to walk through this Sermon on the Mount. It's a sermon that was given, the greatest sermon that was ever given. 
Obviously, 2,000 years ago, Jesus gathered his disciples together and, and then other people started showing up. They all started coming around. They wanted to hear because any time that a guy showed up that had been healing the sick and raising the dead, everybody wanted to hear what he had to say. And so they gathered around and he, and he talked and he preached and he shared important, deep thoughts of things that, that we as followers of Christ, that we need to know. And he made it very clear of, you know, in this, this sermon as he kind of walked it out, he, he kind of talked about, hey, what are the things that we're supposed to be and what are the things that we're supposed to do? Charles talked about that last week, being salt and light. He went on to talk about all the things that, that what Jesus did and what we're supposed to do. And, and he talked about how to, how to deal with others and deal with sin and deal with stuff and, and deal with God, how to be all that God intended for us to be. And so we are walking through this sermon verse by verse. We started a couple of weeks ago. We're going to continue as we march right on through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 to kind of see what, like, what does Jesus say? Because let's be honest, we live in a world of competing voices, don't we? We live in a culture today where there is so much distraction and so much noise and so much advice and so many ideas and so many comments and so many thoughts that we can find ourselves getting a little bit confused. Of like, what does it really mean to be what God wants me to be? You can turn on the television any night of the week and you can find like about 50 different preachers out there preaching and they're all gonna say like lots of different things and many of them really, really good. But here's what I want. What does Jesus say? Because that is actually what we need to know as followers of Jesus Christ. So that's why we're walking through this, this sermon. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So today we're going to be starting in verse 17, uh, where Charles left off last week in verse 16. We're going to jump right into verse 17. And so I want to read this passage, and then we're going to spend some time kind of breaking it down and making sure that when we walk out of here today that every single one of us, our goal is this, is that we're going to understand what does Jesus want me to know. All right, so let's go. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. It says this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of these, uh, the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does, uh, does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has some, something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge will hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. I surely, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to, uh, to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now this picture, this passage that we just read a moment ago is a clear statement. And it deals with really four different ideas, four different things that today we're going to walk through to kind of understand like exactly what does Jesus kind of want us to understand as he walks us through this sermon. Now remember, he delivered this sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, all in one setting at one time. He gathered his people together and he, and he spoke these words. And he did not actually sit there and have, you know, breaks and come back next week and you'll get the next part. It was all one conversation. 
And it's a natural progression, a natural flow. As you read through this passage, as you read through this sermon, he takes you from a very clear beginning. He walks you through point by point, and then he lands it with them powerful statements. And so basically saying, okay, so now go and do this. And so let's walk through today just this one little portion, one little uh, area that we're going to pull out that we just read a moment ago and kind of look at these four things that I believe this passage tells us today. And the first thing that he tells us is why he came. Why is it that Jesus came? What's the point of his arrival on this earth? If you go back again to verses 17 through 19, just do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, uh, one jot, one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore speaks one of the least of these commandments and or breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what is it that Jesus said here, like why he came? What he said is this, I came to fulfill the law. Now, when you see that statement, the law of the prophets, that is a, a New Testament direction, a New Testament statement where he's talking about the Old Testament. So Jesus is not talking about one specific person. He's not speaking about Jeremiah or Isaiah or, or someone like that. He's talking about the entirety of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament that had been written obviously long before Jesus was there. It was passages that were pulled out on Sundays or Saturdays in synagogues there where they would gather together and they would read the Old Testament scrolls. They would read the Old Testament Scriptures. The Pharisees and uh, the scribes would get together and they would interpret to all of the people gathered there, this is what this says, and this is what this means. Now, what we know in this culture and in the time back then is that the Pharisees and the scribes had become so holy and so overrighteous and so legalistic that they had taken what God had given to them and they had added their own thoughts, their own ideas to it, and then had created something that Jesus never really intended. But when he made this statement, you know, talking about the law and the prophets, that he didn't come to abolish it, he came to fulfill it. Now that word fulfill, when you look in the original language, literally means to make complete or to make perfect or to bring it to its greatest uh, identity and its greatest intent. Now when you think about that, like what Jesus is saying is like, I came to bring what the Old Testament says, I came to bring it into reality today, to fulfill it, to make it complete, to make it perfect, to make it better than it has ever been. Now to give you kind of a little bit of an idea of what that might look like, back in 1965 in America, there came out this really cool technology something that was like radical, something that was transformative, something that changed like the, the entire landscape of music. Now you saw a few moments ago, we put that QR code up and some of you took pictures of that and, and went to those websites and you streamed through Apple Play and uh, Apple Music and through uh, Spotify and things like that. Well, back in 1965, that didn't exist. In fact, if you wanted to listen to music in 1965, you had to have something like this. How many of you know what these are? Ladies and gentlemen, behold the old people. <laughs> These are what's called eight track tapes. And I, I wanna bring, I wanna get someone who like is young and I wanna let them hold it because it's kinda like the Holy Grail, right? I mean like something like that these young people have never seen, they've never heard, they can't imagine like what in the world is this? Let's find someone who looks young. You look young, come here real quick. <laughs> so I want you to hold this really quick, okay? So can you imagine a time when if you wanted to listen to music in your car or at your house, that you actually had to have something like this and you would stick it in the player of your car, a big hole in the dash of your car or a big massive player that you had in your house, you would stick this in and then you would listen to the songs. Now, you'll notice that on this thing called an eight track tape, there are four little sections. Do you see that? Yes. Now the reason the four little sections, by the way, have you ever listened to one of these? No. Okay, the four little sections here, <laughs> is because it literally is like different sections of the music and so it would play. And right in the middle of a song, oftentimes, it would actually stop in the middle of the song and it would change over to the next track and then it would continue playing right where it left off. How cool is that? Cool. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> like one of your favorite songs, like your favorite part, it, wait a minute, pause. 
Okay, there it is again. It's awesome. I remember back when I was like in the early 1970s, I was like five, six years old. I had one of these eight, by the way, this is Motown. And so like you look at here, like all the songs in here is Motown. But I remembered one by Roger Miller and it was called King of the Road. How many of you remember King of the Road by Roger Miller? Again, those old people, you gotta love them. Hey, thank you, what's your name? Anna. Anna, and listen, isn't this awesome? It is. Yeah, they're very cool, yeah. 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 <laughs> You'll never see them again. Now, what's interesting, the reason I bring these up is this, is that this is a time, like when you had to listen to music, you had to listen to one of these eight tracks. And so I look at these eight tracks and I, I was looking through some of the songs on here. Uh, there's a song like, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Anybody ever heard that song, right? Uh, songs like, I'll Be There, right? Yep. Uh, how about this one? Uh, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> Come on, baby, right? I mean, you know that song, right? Uh, how about this one? Let's see. Uh, I heard it through the grapevine. How many of you know that song? How many of you just sang that in your head? Are you right? I almost sang it as I was saying it, right? I mean, you can't help but to do that. Like, and so you know, these songs, if you wanted to listen to those songs back in the day, you had to use the old eight-track tape. Now, here's what's interesting. All of the songs that are on these eight-track tapes, it's really cool. All of these songs, you can still listen to. You can listen to them on Apple Music, you can listen to them on Spotify, you can, you know, you can listen to them on some other streaming service if you want, but you will not be able to find an 8-track tape anywhere except for eBay for probably 50 bucks a piece right now, because they don't make them anymore, they don't exist anymore. Now, what Jesus was saying, he was said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it, to make it complete, to make it better, to bring it to its full intent. The intent of these eight track tapes was simply this, is to give you the opportunity to listen to the music. You can still listen to the music, but it has been completed and it is better and it's been brought to its fullest intent. The quality of these songs is horrific. It's awful, it's terrible on this tape. But now you can listen to it, even though it might've been recorded 60 or 70 years ago, it sounds like perfection. That's exactly what Jesus did. We have a world today where there are some pastors who say the Old Testament is not relevant anymore. Like you don't even need to listen to the Old Testament. Don't even read the Old Testament. Just unhitch yourself from the Old Testament. Like that was yesterday. We're now in the New Testament. The only problem with that statement is this. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the old. I came to fulfill, to make it complete. Now listen, if he came to make it fulfilled, to make it complete, to make it better, to bring it to its fullest intent. Understand this. He was basically saying everything that was in the old is still valid. It is still real. It is still important. It is still very uh, legitimate in your walk and relevant to your walk with Christ today. It's just that now because I'm here, I have actually accomplished what you were trying to accomplish in the old. And so when you hear a preacher say, hey, get rid of the Old Testament, what I would say to you is get rid of the preacher and stick with the Word of God. The Word of God does not become less important with time. The Word of God does not come less important because a preacher decides and declares, oh, it's not a big deal anymore. Let me just tell you something. If God took the time to breathe the words of this book out into the hearts and the hands of men who wrote this thousands of years ago. If God took the time to give it, then I am sure going to take the time to read it. And so make sure you understand. So that's what he said. What he came for was to fulfill the old, to make sure that he made it complete, to make it, uh, make it exactly what God intended for it to be. So in light of that, why he came, then he goes on to say in this passage, and here's what you should do. Verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this was a very troubling statement when Jesus made it. And it was troubling because, again, they're coming in a culture and a time when Everyone was listening to and hearing what the Pharisees and the scribes had to say. And here's what they believed. They believed that they were the holiest of all the people in Judaism, that they were the only ones who truly understood exactly what it was that God 
wanted all of us to do and wanted all of us to know. And so therefore, if Jesus said, unless you are better than, more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes, then you will not enter into heaven. So what they're sitting there thinking, like, wait a minute, I'm nowhere near as good as they are. I'm nowhere near as holy as they are. I'm nowhere near as smart as they are. So man, if Jesus is saying, I've got to be better than them, I'll never get there. There's no way I'm getting to heaven. You can see why that would be troubling. But then you have to understand exactly the meaning behind what Jesus was saying. What Jesus was saying is, hey, you don't need a Pharisee or a scribe to bring you into the presence of God. You don't need the wisdom or the righteousness or the holy, holiness or the piety or the, the hypocrisy of a Pharisee and a scribe to teach you what you need to do. Here's all you need to do to believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died and that he would rise again. And through believing in him, that you would be made right with God and have communion with him. I don't know about you, but that's a message that while might have been troubling at first, boy, it would be comforting at last, wouldn't it? To recognize and understand that all this time that I thought the Pharisees were the only one that had the answers. And now here, the son of God is actually coming to me and he's saying to me, I'll give you the answer because I'm the answer. I'll give you hope because I'm hope. I'll give you salvation because I'm the path, the way, the truth, and the life. You see, Jesus was teaching here that as he came to fulfill the law, he was simply telling them, hey, following the law was no longer enough. In the Old Testament, that's all they had. And in the Old Testament, man, they were having to bring the sacrifices to the temple. And they were bringing every, sing, seemingly like every day, bringing animals to the, uh, to the temple. And there they would, they, would, they would sacrifice those animals. And the blood would flow all in the, the streets and in the streams and in the areas there. And so much blood was flowing. Man, they were slicing and dicing. And, and like every single day, those animals were being sacrificed so that they could be made right with God. And here's what Jesus said. Hey, that, no longer enough, no longer needed. Because I have come. And so he gives us this picture, this incredible statement, like, hey, your righteousness now is not bound up in what you can do. Your righteousness now is secured in what I'm about to do and what he did 2,000 years ago for us. And so he told us why he came. He told us what we should do. So then he goes on to say in the rest of this passage, so, so let's do better. Let's take it to the next level. We've got to start acting differently. We've got to start acting better than we once did. You've got to start doing things a little bit differently. And so let's go back to this passage and let's see exactly what he's talking about. In verse 21, he told us this. It's time to get rid of anger. Look what it says in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, well, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. And assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. What Jesus was saying this, hey, in the Old Testament, in, in the Ten Commandments, you were told this, do not murder. And I think we all get that, right? We all understand that. I think everybody in this room recognizes murder is wrong. And so those people at that time, they understood like murder, killing someone without cause, like killing someone innocent, like that was wrong. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You'll pay the price if you do. But then Jesus, remember, came to fulfill, to complete, to bring it to its full intent. He now says, oh, but I tell you that if you call your brother Raka, and Raka literally is a word that means like blockhead. You ever heard the phrase blockhead, right? He said, you blockhead. Like, and, or though you call your brother a fool. Like, like there's a problem here. If you have something against your brother, if you have anger towards your brother without cause, without, you know, understand, like if you're harboring that bitterness and harboring that anger in you, you're no better than a murderer. That's an interesting thing. And so he says, get things right. 
Like, like, like make sure you, you, you come to reconciliation. Come to some kind of connection there where everything is better is what he's talking about. In fact, it, it reminded me again of something from my childhood. And, and, and it looks something like this, this picture here. How many remember the Rock'em Sock'em Robots? Again, behold the old. This is awesome. And so this was a toy that you would get together, a little game. You see those little handles on the right, and so the handles on the left, and two people would get there, and you would keep pushing those buttons until somebody, like, knocked the block off the person. You can see the one on the left, the red, you know, his block got knocked off. And that's how you would win the game. And here's what Jesus is saying. There are a lot of people, a lot of Christians that are coming to church every single week. They're coming to church, and they're coming with the heart condition of the Rock'em Sock'em Robots. That they're walking into the room with that same kind of idea. That we're walking into the room, we're coming to church, we're all excited about being here. We have our Bibles in hand. I don't, mine's right up there, but you get the picture. And we come to church with this idea, we're going to worship. We're going to celebrate who God is. And we come in and we sit down and we have a, have a seat in the room here. We gather together with our family and our friends, and we're all happy here. We want to worship together. How are you? I'm good. You're good. Isn't it great? God is good. Very good. You're supposed to say all the time. There it is. There it is. <laughs> and so we come together to worship. And when we come together to worship, we're sitting here. We've got our Bibles in our hands. We're all excited about worship, you know. And then we're sitting here and say, see that guy over there? Look how smug he looks. I can't tell you. Let me tell you what he did to me last week. He said this and he said that. Maybe so, man, if you look at him, he's sitting over there all pious and all acting like he loves God. Look at him. Can you believe that? I can't believe he would do that. And then Scott or Charles gets up there and says, it's time to worship. And they little jerk. Oh, oh, praise God. <laughs> and that's what we do. And we wonder why we have a situation in our heart where we're always conflicted in our walk with God. It's because we come to church in a, a situation like the Rock'em Sock'em Robots where we're really angry with the dude over here because of what he did or what he said or how he acted. We're mad because of all the things that he's done to us. And we come here with that anger and that bitterness, that root of bitterness in our heart towards, and I'm pointing at you because you waved at me, uh, towards him like he's just the worst guy ever. And we expect God to bless our time in worship. And so Jesus says, no, don't, don't do that. Man, if you're going to come into church, if you're going to come into worship, and you're going to come and you're going to bring your gifts to the altar, and by the way, every time you walk into this room, you're bringing your gifts to the altar. That's what you're doing. Every time that you're at home and you open the word of God, you're bringing your gifts to the altar. Every time you're sitting at home and you're about to spend some time in prayer, talking with God alone, just you and God, you're bringing your gifts to the altar altar and God says oh and if you bring the gifts to the altar and there's bitterness and there's anger and that is not something that you have fixed that you have changed set it down walk away don't even start to worship until you get things right I think probably that speaks to a lot of us in this room I think a lot of us in this room have somebody like right now that their mind their name is going through your mind like somebody that, you know, I love them, <laughs> I don't like them. You know, I know I've got to love them because I'm a Christian, but man, they just tick me off. Anybody like, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but you know that that exists and you know that's reality and you know that is a real condition that we walk through. And Jesus said, hey, don't do that because if you do, you're going to pay a price. Look at back to verse 26. I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Now, it may not cost you actual money, but understand this, it will cost you. It will cost you. And I've got to be honest with you as a pastor, there have been many situations and many times where I've walked into this room where I've had the opportunity of talking with somebody at the altar after a service. And if that anger and that bitterness is something that's so obvious and so apparent and they're broken and I recognize that they had just sat through a, a service where the worship like today was absolutely awesome, where we were worshiping God together and singing the praises to God for who he is and what he's done. And we're singing those words, your life is power, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. And they, they've heard those words and then they've heard the reading of the word of God. 
They've had the opportunity of praying together in this room. And I know this, and they missed every single bit of it because all that they could talk about and all that they could focus on is the anger and the bitterness that was so overwhelming. Jesus says, listen, guys, fix it. Fix it. Change it. You've got to do better. And so he says, you've got to get rid of that anger. Now, the second thing he tells us is this, is you've got to get rid of lust. Let's read verses 27 and following. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus clearly teaches here that the Old Testament said that if you're caught in adultery, that you need to pay the price. But here, what he's teaching us is this, that the overt act of adultery is not the only way to sexual sin. That sexual sin is not something that is an outward act, it's a condition of the heart. And that's what he's saying here in this passage. He's making it very clear that outward sin will never take place without already having been grown and, and, and building within the heart and the mind of the person. And that's why today I believe firmly that Satan has figured out how he can use pornography to destroy people in our culture. That Satan has figured out how he can use pornography to make people, even people sitting in this room, look at images and watch things and, and experience things that, that they should never watch or see or experience because he knows that, that what it will do is it will change the condition of the heart. And if he can change the condition of the heart, he knows he's got you. And so what Jesus is saying here, hey, listen, yeah, adultery is wrong. You bet it is. I'm not saying that that's not sin anymore. That's not what he said. But what he's saying is, hey, there's more to it than you think. Because if you look at someone with lust in your hearts, and that word lust, you go back in the original language, it literally means a longing for, like a desire for, like I have to have it. And that's the picture that Jesus is saying. When you look at someone with that in your heart and that in your mind, like that is sin. And that's a problem. And that destroys. Now we're here in the middle of, end of January, January 29th. And like a lot of us, um, in this new year, I've, I've kind of made a plan and made a de decision that I'm going to lose weight this year. And it seems like I do it every January because what I do is I do it in January, February, March, and then I gain weight the rest of the year. It's awesome. I love it. Great plan. <laughs> and so I'm in this season right now like where I'm on a diet. I'm trying to lose weight, right? And so I'm trying to eat better and eat right and, and, and you know, stay away from carbs and stay away from bread and stay away from sweets and stay away from those kinds of things, Right. And so I'm trying my very best to like stay away from that stuff so I'm not like buying that stuff and bringing it into my house. And like if I'm sitting in a situation where a lot of people have those things around, like I'm trying to avoid like reaching over, you know, grabbing French fries off people's plates, all those kinds of things. I mean, it's just a natural thing, right? But so, so you know, like if you're on a diet and if you know that like the, the, well, you've got to be very careful because you know you're, the weaknesses that you have, you understand like when you walk into a place and you're sitting there and and if you sit there and the person with you orders something like this and you're on a diet, that's a problem. Because i got to be honest with you, that's Chicago-style pizza. And I believe firmly Chicago-style pizza, Jesus brought it with him in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. <laughs> that was not created by man. That comes directly from the heart and the hand of God. It is inspired. It is infallible. It is inerrant. <laughs> Chicago-style pizza. Look at that cheese. Look at that sauce. Look at that crust. Come on, people. Who's getting hungry? Yeah. yeah. You look at that. They may not, man, I've got to have that. Man, I, oh, that looks so good. And I've got to be honest, even on a diet, so if I went to dinner with my family and, and I'm sitting there and like eating, trying to eat grilled chicken, which did not come from God, by the way. And I'm eating grilled chicken, and the rest of my family orders Chicago-style pizza, and they bring it to the table. i got to be honest with you, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to have a hard time. It's going to be difficult. Because I'm going to sit there and do what all of us on diets always do. <laughs> One bite won't hurt me. <laughs> right? Okay, I show you this, and I tell you this, to bring it into a parallel, into a situation, so we understand what Jesus was saying. That, hey, 
Yes, adultery is wrong. Yes, sexual sin is wrong. But understand this. What you think, what you see, and how you respond, that can be sin too. Now, if I know that that pizza sitting at the table is going to cause me a problem, and if I really want to be strong and do the right thing, guess what I'm going to do? I'm probably not going to sit at that table. I'm not going to have them order that at the table. I'm not going to go hang out where people are eating that because I've got to do better. The same thing is true when it comes to sexual sin. I know this because I'm, I'm not blind and I'm not, you know, very, you know, you know, gullible or, or, or kind of like not very, you know, very shallow, not very deep here. I know there are people in this room that struggle with pornography. I know that. I know that as I look out of a crowd of thousands of people, there are people in this room that have a tough time. I know there are people watching and listening right now who struggle with this very thing, this addiction that comes through pornography. And here's what I will tell you. The more time you sit at the table looking at the things that you're looking at, knowing that it's not good for you, knowing that it's not going to make you better, knowing it's not going to make you healthy, the more time that you spend looking at those things, that's what Jesus is talking about. You are breaking the heart and the command of God. And so the natural response is to set aside the things that we know are temptation, to set aside the things that we know we can't deal with. Remember, the word lust means a longing for. Now, that doesn't mean if you're walking down the street and you see someone who's attractive walking towards you, that you see them and you think, oh, they're attractive. Nothing. That's not sin. You didn't commit a sin. But here's what I will tell you. If you're walking down the street and someone coming towards you is attractive and you say, oh, they're attractive. Oh, man, they're attractive. Oh, baby, they're attractive. You've just committed sin. You see, lust is not seeing, lust is longing. Lust is not an awareness of, lust is a desire to have. And so we have to make sure we understand to put ourselves in the place of, in the condition of, in the position of avoiding that which we know will create a longing for and a desire for in our hearts of things that we know we should not and cannot have. You got it? Do you understand that? And here's why it's so important. Here's why Jesus made this such a, a very specific and a very important point because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, he says this, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Who owns your body? Say it louder. Who owns your body? It is not yours. It was bought with a price. What was the price? Jesus died on the cross to redeem you, to pay for you, to buy you. How dare we live our lives in opposition to the price that Jesus paid for us? How dare we walk down a road that we know leads to destruction after Jesus did all that he did to redeem us and bring us into fellowship with himself? And that's what he says. So let me give you just quick three applications as we close. The first one is this. The Old Testament is not an outdated collection of books which have no value in today's world. It's a groundwork for the gospel. And so if people tell you the Old Testament doesn't matter, they're not right. They're lying. Second thing, live in fellowship with others. Living with fellowship with others is far better than living in conflict. And if possible, make things right with those that you have done wrong or with those who have done wrong to you. Now, Romans 12, 18 is a very important verse, and it says this, as far as it is possible, as much as you possibly can, as much as it depends on you, make things right with others. What that tells you is that sometimes you can't make things right. Sometimes the guy sitting over here on the third row who was waving at me a few moments ago, sometimes that guy, he is such a jerk that there's nothing I can do to make things right with him. Like he is horrible, he is awful, he is ungodly, and he's going to stay, and there's nothing I can do to make things right. But here's what I must do. While I may not be able to make things right with him, I have to get rid of that anger and bitterness and basically say, dude, you're a jerk. Get out of my life. Yeah, thank you for coming to church today. Uh, <laughs> so that's what you have to do. 
as much as it depends on you, as much as it's possible. And third thing, be diligent in removing tempted, tempting pictures, images, and people, and be quick to seek the forgiveness that God is so willing to give. Are you going to mess up sometimes? Of course you are. And that's what 1 John 1, 9 tells them. When you do, confess your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But that does not give you license to jump right back into the cesspool five seconds later. When you mess up, get it right with God. And then as Jesus told that woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarification, God, of your desire and your plan for our lives. God, thank you for helping us to see and to know and to understand your plan and your path for all of us. God, we thank you that you came. You didn't have to. Thank you that you died and rose again for us. You certainly didn't have to. But thank you for also teaching us, God, how to experience and how to have life to the fullest as a result of what you give. And God, right now in this room, I know there are a lot of people who are broken, a lot of people who are hurting, a lot of people who are in sin. And God, I know that today there are a lot of people who need conviction. And God, you tell us in the scripture very clearly, the Holy Spirit comes to convict. And God, I don't have any doubt in my mind that probably the Holy Spirit right now is doing a lot of work and a lot of hearts in this place. And so God, I pray that you would bring them to that moment of conviction. That's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something to celebrate. Because if we do not feel conviction, then we honestly have to ask ourselves the question, do we even know Christ at all? And so God, I pray that for that person right now here that needs to get things right with you, God, I pray that you'll help them to make a decision in a moment. God, for that person who doesn't know you at all, who's never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, believing that he died and that he rose again, Lord, make this the moment where they say, listen, I, I, I want to be a child of God. Help them to make that decision. And God, will give you the praise for it. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, in a moment we're gonna stand, and when we do, our team, as always, is gathered here, and we'd love to talk with you. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to share with you who Jesus is. Maybe you want to come down and say, listen, I want to meet Jesus. Tell me what to do. Literally, it can be that simple of a question. <clears throat> like, I want to meet Christ. I don't know how to do it. What do I do? Our team is here, man. We, we would love nothing more than to share that with you. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you've got some anger issues, some bitterness issues. Maybe you've got some pornography issues. Maybe you've got some sexual sin issues. Maybe you've got some other things that are going on that you just need to get it right with God. Like, like the altar is a great place to do that. And so I encourage you, man, come on down in a moment when we stand and, and, and lean on the steps that are nothing special about them. They're just steps, but lean figuratively on the promise that God gives to you here that all things can be made right. Maybe some of you are here today and you do have that anger and that bitterness. And maybe you need to walk across the room to find that person that you have a problem with and get things right now. Whatever it is, if you want to join our church, come to be part of our family, whatever that might look like, let's stand. Charles is going to lead us. Let's step out right now. Lord, to Jesus I surrender all. To him I freely gave. I His presence daily Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad you joined us. If you prayed to receive Christ today, we'd love to hear from you. We want to help you as you begin this journey of faith in Jesus Christ. So send us an email to the address on the screen, pastor at trbc.org. Likewise, if you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus, but you'd like to know more, well, we're here to help you. So just reach out to us. We'd love to tell you more. 
Our mission at Thomas Road is to change our world by developing Christ followers who love God and love people. And if you'd like to help us fulfill that mission by giving to our ministry, then go to the link on your screen and make your contribution today. Help us help others with the life-changing truth of God's love.